Welcome back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, more specifically. This is Energy in America with Emily Medina, who joins us from Mexico City to talk about energy in Mexico. That's, that's part of the Americas, you know. We, we want to think of it that way, and we want all the Americas to be joined, right, Emily? We want to be together yes. in the Americas. Absolutely, especially in this trying times. Yeah. Oh, gee, I, you know, um, I talked to our correspondent, Carlos Juarez, he is from Mexico, and so he's with the University of the Americas in uh, Puebla. And uh, <clears throat> talking about uh, COVID, a serious problem in Mexico. And for some reason, yes. AMLO did not take it seriously. And then he caught it himself. There's irony in that. So, um, electricity, you're with, uh, of course, uh, he brings the Energy Policy Research Organization out of Washington with Lupo Urisi, and you look at it from, you know, the vantage of Mexico, and there's been a significant develop, development in Mexico by electric, electrical generation, I guess. Uh, I quote, reform, end quote. So what is the nature of this reform? Who, who initiated it, and what does it do? Yes, Jay. So this week, you know, there's been some developments on Mexico's energy policy. Um, more precisely, um, the president passed or sent a priority bill to Congress to reform the electricity sector. And what this bill seeks to change is the dispatch system. So I'm not sure if you know what the dispatch system is, but I'll give a little bit of an explanation as to what it is for those who don't maybe um, have an understanding of the electricity market. So the dispatch system basically means that, you know, Mexico has or follows a merit order in its grid system where we have um, a system that prioritizes more economic and efficient sources of energy like natural gas and renewable energy particularly wind and solar, which are very, um, very um, efficient here in Mexico, considering that we have a lot of sun and wind. So here in Mexico, you know, we have a high um, potential for renewable energy. But what this bill seeks to do is to, instead of prioritizing um, energy sources that are more um, economic and efficient, it seeks to prioritize CFPs um, power generation. And CFP is a national utility system. Uh, it's, a, it, it, it's state owned. So before the energy reform in Mexico, it was a state monopoly, you know? And, you know, let's back up a little bit, okay? So the bill, um, intends to have um, to prioritize energy coming from CFE power plants. And what this means is that instead of following the merit order based on cost and efficiency, it does not distinguish uh, on the quality of the source of electricity. So the bill seeks to prioritize CFE's power generation particularly hydro energy, um, which is about 7% of Mexico's electricity today. And it also seeks to you know, prioritize, um, I would say more dirty sources of electricity like fuel, oil, and diesel. Pa independent power producers would, be, would result highly disadvantaged from this policy. So um, I guess uh, why uh, why is this why does this bill get passed? Who is driving it, uh, and for what interest? Well, as you may already know, um, the the government that we have right now in Mexico is very nationalistic in its approach to energy policy. It basically has the, the mission or intent 
to prioritize both state-owned energy companies, CFE, which is Comisión Federal Electricidad, which is a utility company, and also Pemex, which is uh, Petróleos Mexicanos, the hydrocarbon Mexican energy company. So the whole purpose of this policy is to return market power to CFE. And basically, you know, what's happened since the start of the energy reform, which was passed in 2014 by the, the predecessor of AMLO, which is Enrique Peña Nieto. So he passed an, a historic energy reform that basically opened up the energy sector to private sector participants and dissolve the, the state-owned monopoly. So now that there's a lot more um, competitivity in the energy sector, because we have, you know, a large number of independent power producers participating in Mexico's energy sector since the opening of the energy reform, you know, and there's been huge amounts of foreign capital flowing into Mexico and investing in, in energy projects along the energy value chain. And basically what this means is that right now the government sees private sector participation as a threat instead of seeing it as a means to be able to allow for energy companies to produce um, electricity at the most efficient cost and also in a way that it's beneficial for the environment. So uh, the word reform is so tricky. Uh, the one in uh, 2014 sounds like a really positive, um, you know, uh, positive progressive change. The one now doesn't sound like reform at all. It sounds like something else. It's, in fact, it's, it attempts to reverse the reform that was done in 2014. Am I right? Exactly. Um, since taking office two years ago, AMLO and the head of the CFE, which is Manuel Barlet, also very nationalist, that so the government basically does not believe on or does not favor a market-friendly approach. It is more um, advocate of an idea, no? That they want Mexican companies to, to give power to Mexican consumers. But in reality, you know, after eight decades of, of monopoly, we've seen that they have not been able to satisfy the needs of the Mexican population in terms of delivering energy in an efficient way. So this, this is the main reason why we had an energy reform in the first place. So it's very unfortunate that we have a very, a government where, with a very different approach to energy policy than what we have before. I guess you can say it's almost, you know, in complete 360 degree difference of what we had before. So this stark contrast in energy policy is really, you know, causing severe stress to many, you know, energy investors who have a lot of capital and stake and a lot of energy projects in Mexico that are, that are currently at risk. Well, that's, it's always rough when you do that, when you discourage uh, an investor who has come in and put a lot of money in the on the table and uh, you give him, you know, negative encouragement, you make it hard for him politically or economically uh, because there are others in the pipeline from somewhere else who would, um, you know, be, be likely to put additional investment capital into that sector, but who are discouraged having seen what goes on with their predecessors. This happens in Hawaii all the time. And so it's not a good thing. But, but Kriya, let me, let me just get a little environmental, um, you know, uh, 
environmental coverage here in the sense that, A, uh, what is the situation in Mexico? Does, does electrical energy, is it available everywhere? Is the penetration complete to all of you know, the areas, including the outlying areas in Mexico? If I'm in a small town uh, in the middle of nowhere, am I gonna be able to get electrical service? Yeah, Jay. So Mexico, as you know, has a huge population. We you know have 80 about million, it's 80 125 million. million. Well, what's 40 million here and there? Or 80 million. I may be confused. <laughs> 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 but you know, it's a huge population. Um, and you know, and to give people power in all areas of the country, which you know, we're a developing country. Um, you know, there's, you know, stark differences. You, you, you're, you may be in a state that, you know, has a high economic growth that you, you know, you drive, you know, a few miles down the road and then you are, you know, in, in neighborhoods that, you know, lack access to basic services, including energy. And it's a big issue in the country and, and the energy reform sought to address this issue. Right now, you know, 98% of the Mexican population has access to electricity, but it's not the same to have access to electricity, you know, of poor quality than having, you know, steady access to reliable energy. And also, you know, we have to take cost into consideration because, you know, there's a, a large number of the Mexican population that is it doesn't have you know uh, uh, a high income and and energy prices really do affect um, uh, their their balance you know. Well, I and, wanted to ask you about that. You know, we have a problem in in Hawaii for many years because we're you know wedded to fossil fuel for the most part, and fossil fuel can be volatile and expensive. So the question is, what are the rates like in Mexico? You say that in the small towns, people don't have a lot of money. It's a problem. But how, how expensive is it? Can you talk in American dollars? Can you translate that to American dollars? Yeah. Um, well, it depends significantly who you ask. <laughs> um, and because based on your geographic location, you get a price for electricity because the cost, you know, considers things like transportation of energy. And, you know, we have areas of the country like in the south of Mexico, like the Yucatan Peninsula, which is, you know, um, who that has very high electricity prices at around, I don't know, an average household will have. I've seen, you know, bills of six hundred dollars per month. So, and this is because, you know, there, uh, the south of Mexico lacks access to natural gas because of its position. But if you look at places like Monterrey in the north of the country that borders the U.S. and has access to very affordable natural gas, you will see very uh, low energy prices. So it depends on the area you are in. Um, but right now, in I mean, in, in areas like Mexico City, there are also, are also very, you know, um, very, uh, there are demand centers that are, you know, located in close, close to the production centers. And they, and we have, you know, um, electricity prices that uh, you know can range for I don't know about a hundred dollars per month but there's also um, uh, there's also an, a billing system that takes into account um, if you are a high electricity consumer or a low electricity consumer and based on your status you get you get you know the prices corresponding um, each level I want to do. I want to settle one thing before we go too much uh, uh, further, Emily. I have my my friend Alexa here. Uh, Alexa, uh, what's the population of Mexico? In 2020, the population of Mexico was 129 million people. 
Okay, yeah. So I, I think I was closer. You're right. I owe you a tequila. <laughs> Okay, well, let's let's move on to the, the the whole thing about what the the reform, if you will, in 2014 did, and whether it was working, um, and why in the world this second re quote reform would take place, and whether that undermined you know the progress that the country had made uh, for independent uh, uh, electricity producers in the years from 2014. Yeah, so sorry, what was your question? We, I assume we made progress, Mexico made progress mm -hmm. under the 2014 reform bill. Um, was it working? Was there any, and, and uh, I guess it was, it was bringing foreign investment into the electrical sector. Uh, mm -hmm. was, was there really a need to have, you know, was it working to the point where, you know, you, you could say there was no need to change it? Uh, was there a need to change it uh, in the in the bill that just got passed? If you ask me, uh, the, the or and most energy analysts in the country, we would say that you know that this electricity reform that the current government is trying to undertake really is hurting investment, and there's not a need to go back. You know, we we already moved from where we were before. Uh, that was a monopolistic model. We already saw, you know, that it didn't work. It, it might have worked, you know, at the beginning, but you know, over the years, it proved that it, it's not the system that Mexico re needs right now. It's a the monopolistic system, you know, leads to things like corruption and lack of investments in areas that need it. So if you ask me, the correct approach is to, you know, to stay with the energy reform that has been very beneficial in attracting investment and also in helping the energy transition in Mexico. Because if you look at CFE's power plants and some of them are very polluting and you know if you don't have a model that incentivizes new projects and new um, and new developments in clean energy or including natural gas then you are stuck with you know an inefficient system that is highly polluting so, what about the uh, cost factor? Is uh, it, I, I take it from what you say that the independent power producers, uh, as as in, as um, as capitalized by investment from outside the country, um, are focused on renewables. Am I right about that? They're focused along, you know, the different sources of energy. They're not exclusive to clean power. Um, we mainly see independent power producers owning power plants on that run on natural gas, which are combined cycle power plants. And we also see a lot of projects in renewable energy like solar and wind. So those are the most prominent sources of energy that, that are, you know, that oper being operated by the independent power operators. So what would it like to be an independent power operator? Um, are we talking about a lot of little independent power operators around the country rather than a, a few huge utility companies? And is there is there an advantage to that in terms of uh, connecting with the grid, uh, in terms of reducing prices for the product, in terms of coordinating their efforts? Um, or are they more efficient, you think, as a marketplace and as a delivery system than the, the old way with the, you know, a handful of large utilities? So the independent power producers basically produce energy and they typically sell it to the CFE, to the state-owned utility company as mandated in the law. They have to sell that power to the CFE 
and then the CFE, you know, um, puts it in the system with all of the all, all of the other sources of energy and sells it to the end producer. So basically how it works is that we have, you know, um, you know, we don't have like that many um, independent, we don't have that many operators um, that sell energy to the end consumer directly. But th this way, um, the CFE can, you know, can manage the load from multiple stakeholders instead of being the only um, company in charge of producing energy. And this has resulted in a very you know, efficient model that is practiced in many other countries. Actually, the energy reform was built using best practices and it's a very competitive uh, model that before this government took place, there was long-term auctions where the CFE would purchase power um, from, from independent power operators to then you know, get the best price. And since this government took place, they've kind of discontinued the auction model. And right now it's based basically on the long-term contracts that the CFE has with the independent power producers. So, uh, let me let me uh, go to some questions we got from our viewing audience, Emily. Sure. Okay. Um, it seems that AMLO is moving toward a populist Mexico first energy policy. Does he have a lot of political support uh, for that uh, initiative? Or is he operating without political support? Yes, that's absolutely correct. You know, AMLO is basically moving in the direction of, you know, uh, favoring CFE and Pemex, both state-owned companies, to give them all the power in the energy sector, undermining private sector participation. And what this is causing is basically, you know, uh, an issue where private sector companies are not that happy with the government right now because there's a lot of, you know, of investments at stake um, from this policy. You mean they that, may lose their investment? Yes. So uh, basically, their investment is at risk. They they would challenge it in courts. It's not like they are gonna just lose their investments because the, it's in the constitution that the government has to respect the contracts that were awarded legally. So what this means is that there's gonna be um, possible um, investor state dispute settlements, which is you know not a fun situation for the country to be in especially in this moment where our economy is going through, you know, a harsh time. Yeah, I have uh, more, more along the same line, other questions for you, Emily. Uh, the second related question is what options do foreign investors have? I assume uh, some of them are American uh, foreign investors, but it could be Europe, but it could be Asia. What options do foreign investors have? Um, does this policy in this, this new quote reform negate any provisions of the USMCA that was, uh, you know, inked while Trump was mm -hmm. in office. Yes, so that's absolutely correct. You know, um, this Mexican electricity reform that the government wants to pass, it, it basically, it wants to pass, you know, this law. It's a bill that will you know, basically favor the CFE and Pemex. And if you do that, you immediately violate the Mexican constitution and also the USMCA. So you violate the Mexican constitution because you give priority to the state companies, CFE in this case, and instead of having, you know, uh, a fair level playing field. So this is completely unconstitutional. 
because the companies that participated in and have contracts are you know are in their right to compete in a in an equal level playing field. Yeah. Well, going back, uh, going back a mile a minute. So you you mentioned a minute ago that maybe there would be litigation. Is there litigation? Is there a political attempt to reverse this latest quote reform? It sounds like somebody needs to do that. Is anybody doing that? Yes. So the bill um, was was passed um, by the president to the Me to the Mexican Chamber. So to Congress. And what this means is that the Congress has 31 days to discuss the bill. And it's more than likely gonna be approved because the government holds a majority. You know, it goes to your first question of whether, you know, how much power does the government have? And the answer to that is that AMLO holds a lot of power in Congress. And he, um, uh, you know, he has, currently a 60% approval rating. So he's doing very good in the polls. Um, and basically what this means is that although it's gonna pass in the, in the Congress more than likely, it will still um, be disputed by, particularly by the affected companies. So, the you know the energy companies are going to dispute the the policy and it will more than likely go to the supreme court who then gets to rule um you know in favor of whatever they decide and it's more than likely going to be in favor of the companies given that the bill is is unconstitutional well, that'll be a positive, but you know, how, how do things work in the Mexican courts? Are we going to see a decision on that in the near term, or is it going to be after, uh, you know, years later? It should be, you know, um, uh, a matter of months. Earlier this year, um, or last year, actually, in April last year, there was a similar um, executive order passed by the energy ministry in a change that they wanted to do based on um, the grid reliability, arguing that renewable energy was causing intermittency to the grid and that, you know, that they needed to prevent more renewable energy projects from coming online, which was, you know, lacked completely, uh, it didn't have the evidence to support the policy. And what happened is that today, um, the court ruled um, against this um, energy ministry policy. So we have, and luckily, a Supreme Court that is very, um, and how would you call it? It follows, you know, a strong, it's a strong institution. And this really is, it's important today. It is. Yeah, checks and balances. You, you, you know, it's wonderful that you have that. So let me let me go to the third part of the question that this viewer submitted, uh, which is actually in many ways the most interesting part. You know, because these uh, independent producers are either um, American managed or American, you know, capitalized, and uh, or maybe from somewhere else. But America has a, a, an investment role in these independent energy producers and. They are, for the most part, I take it from this conversation, they're progressive and they could do a lot to democratize the uh, uh, energy in, in Mexico. And therefore, um, although it's not clear how the relationship between Biden and AMLO is going to go, because AMLO took his time in recognizing Biden's election, mm -hmm. which I thought was not a good move on AMLO's mm -hmm. part. And so the relationship may be off to a bit of a rocky start. But the question is, um, you know, what can Biden do? What is Biden doing? What is Joe Biden doing to help the American energy investors to, and managers uh, who, who are creating and operating these independent energy companies in Mexico? What can he do to help them? What, what can he do to protect American interests? 
Does he have influence? Does he try to exert influence on, on AMLO? What, what is the role of the United States here? Well, you know, we're in a very difficult position where, you know, the U.S. is Mexico's closest ally, and we're treating, you know, foreign investors in our country in a very, you know, um, bad way, you know, by, you know, um, going in opposite ways of, you know, what the law stipulates and creating a lot of uncertainty and risk to foreign investments, particularly, you know, of one of our closest allies, the U.S. So what this does is that it creates, you know, uh, increasing tension with, with the, the U.S. government, um, which already, you know, um, or I guess it was a month ago or, some, or recently that the U.S. Congress sent a letter to, to the Mexican government saying that they were, you know, concerned about the direction that the Mexican government was taking the energy sector in and basically, you know, saying that it, it's important that Mexico abide to its commitments. And, you know, they've, you know, sent out these letters and, you know, already given clear notice to the government that they're not happy with what it is doing. However, you know, I haven't seen much um, action yet in terms of the unfolding of the legal disputes, but I think that, you know, it's a matter of time before we start seeing increased, you know, pressure in terms of litigation and that type of thing in, in terms to the Mexican government, mm -hmm. which is going to really affect the, the relationship. Very, very but interesting. What I think really. the government right now, you know, Biden taking office, I think um, it's going to be interesting to see how he exerts, you know, a pressure on Mexico to abide to its commitments. And I think a way that, or an approach that he's going to take, is going to be on the environmental side, because th this reforms that he, that AMLO wants to do, go or are a threat to to our commitments in the Paris Agreement. So I think, you know, the government, Biden can, you know, hold AMLO accountable in a way um, that, you know, that basically saying that, you know, they're not, with this policy, they're not going to be able to meet their renewable energy targets and what have you. Well, we're not finished with this. We'll have to circle back with you and, and see how it goes over the next few months. Very interesting discussion, Emily. Emily Medina with Ebring in Mexico City. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure, Dee. Aloha.